Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Today our topic is interproximal stripping and our guest is Dr. Bjorn Zacherson, who is a duly trained orthodontist and periodontist from the University of Oslo in Norway. I want to thank you Bjorn for allowing us to do this today. Uh, Dr. Zacherson is certainly uniquely qualified to discuss the topic of interproximal stripping, uh, having received uh, both orthodontic training and also training in periodontics. Where did you get your training? Well, uh, Jim, uh I actually started as a periodontist uh, after my graduation in uh, Stockholm in 1963. I thought that I would like to study under Jens Verhag, which was at that time the big name in periodontics, and he was just as close by as Oslo. So this is my reason for moving to Oslo and starting my postgraduate training. And then at that time, the first year was a basic year where we took courses in basic sciences together with the other graduates and uh, this is how I gradually ended up in orthodontics because uh, one of the uh, ortho graduate student was uh, the woman that was later becoming my wife so I switched at that time but I always was close to periodontics and I was staying with Werhag for quite some time and, and I still admire him very much he has influenced my thinking and stimulated my interest in periodontics, which I have maintained over the years. Well, certainly the example of interproximal stripping would be one place where orthodontics and periodontics would really become intermingled. I know my uh, first experience, as I'm sure many individuals who got involved in interproximal stripping some time ago, really came at the request of a patient who I was a university student who was going to be here for a year. and said to me, is there any way, since I have sort of a mild to moderate crowding problem, that I could avoid removing teeth? And so I thought about it, and I don't know whether I had really heard about anyone stripping interproximally, and I know that in dental school everybody is taught that enamel is sacred and so on. Mm. But I decided and did treat this patient, turned out to be one of my American board cases 15 years later, or at least 15 years now anyway. Mm. And really until what, the late 70s, early 80s, no one was really talking about interproximal stripping as a, as a modality. When did you get involved in this and how, what was your thinking as, again, as a duly trained orthodontist and periodontist, what are the, the concerns and also the advantages that you see in this technique? Well, Jim, there, there are two reasons why people were reluctant to do interproximal stripping to start with. And number one, as you mentioned, enamel was sacred. Everybody believed that the outermost superficial layers of enamel were more resistant, more fluoride rich, and, and, and just couldn't be removed. And of course over the years that has changed and today enamel is regarded as a dynamic surface with remineralization taking place, not necessarily to the same hardness and fluoride content and as an intact surface, but you really don't need that. I think it has importance on how you recontour the teeth because if you just flatten the surfaces, if you do them carelessly, I think you can cause problems uh, to the enamel surfaces and create carious problems, but properly done, I don't think you see that. The second area is the bone between the teeth, and the concern was that if the bone between the teeth became too thin, you would have a periodontal problem, and once you had a periodontal process going on, it would just be much more rapid. And this over the years also has been disqualified as an argument, and it was really none of my real concerns because I thought that in many crowded cases the teeth and the roots are much closer together than in a well-aligned case where you had done a, a fair amount of stripping anyhow. So I was not very worried about the things that worried many other people, but I didn't have a good technique to do that until my year in um, when I was uh, a visiting professor at Loma Linda in California that was in 79, and then I was uh, in good contact with Don Tuverson, which, which uh, over the, the years has become a very good friend of mine. And I was impressed by his 
professionalism in doing this and his technique, which included at that time um, an anterior strip, uh, an anterior separator and his garnet discs to do that. And just by them broadening the contacts in, in a nice professional manner, I was impressed that that was a technique for the future. And I've used it ever since. And in the past five years, increasingly more and more. And uh, for different reasons, not only to, uh, to, to, to treat borderline extraction cases, there are many other reasons also to do both posterior and anterior stripping. Anything special you want to talk about in that respect? Well, um, yes. Uh, there are cases where, <clears throat> let's take, you take an average adult person with crowding in the anterior regions. In my thinking, these teeth have been crowded for a long time and they have not been subjected to a normal proximal wear, which means that most of these teeth are abnormal in shape. Now, if you take that case and realign those teeth, more often than not, you will find that even if the gingiva interdental papilla before filled out the distance between the teeth, afterwards it will not do that. And in many cases, that is aesthetically disturbing. In other words, the patient is coming to you to get an aesthetic improvement, but in reality is ending up with something that is not very aesthetic, gingival triangles between the level teeth. And there's just one way to remove that, and that is to reshape the teeth to normal contour. And more often than not, these teeth are very triangular, so that you have contacts in the contact point area, but they are narrow at the gingival margin. And by recontouring them and making them less triangular, we, you will have immediate gingiva fill in and a much more aesthetic result. This is something that we have experienced also in more advanced periodontal cases, but in those instances, it's not always possible to have complete gingiva fill in uh, after the procedure. Do you do the stripping yourself? Yes, I do that. It's, it's, I think it's, it's a difficult and uh, demanding procedure, and it's, uh, you have to have, make decisions all the time on where to remove enamel, how much to remove, and how to reshape the teeth. And you have to be careful enough that you don't get uh, cuts or side effects by those uh, diamond discs that we are using. You want to st speak uh, specifically about the technique that you would use? Well, as I mentioned, we started to use Tuberson's technique with separators and, and garnet discs. The problem with the separators is that they are very painful to use, and the garnet discs are quite thick. So in order not to need to separate the, so much between the teeth, we started to use very thin diamond discs, which was one-tenth of a millimeter, which is very thin and flexible. And by doing, using them, we don't have to separate if there isn't any broken contact. And then by using the separator, you don't have to separate so much. So we, we, our technique consists of, in the anterior region, to use that separator and to start in the area of least crowding and using the diamond disc and then just polish the teeth with Tuberson's garnet discs. And then by going systematically from the least crowded contact to the next least crowd, crowded contact, which may be in some other place, totally di distance from where you were just working, then ending up at the most crowded area at the end. I think we have had a technique that is working very efficiently and, and very satisfactorily. When you talk about separators, at least in my mind, there's two things that come up besides brass wire. One of which is uh, an O-ring, that you know, a circular O-ring, or a spring type. Now, are you talking about those type of separators, or mm. are you talking about something different, right? I'm talking about something totally different. I'm talking about a separator that is driving the teeth from one another as it was used in all conservative dentistry. You mean a screw type? A screw type like a, separator. Almost like a clamp. Yes, that, that's what, uh, what we are talking about. It's an anterior Elliott separator that you can move a screw from one side to the other depending on how you use it. Mm -hmm. And then you, by tightening the screw, you are opening up the distance between the teeth. And the principle behind is by doing so, you will have 
adequate room for a perfect anatomical contouring of the teeth so that you just don't just cut the teeth. Okay, I think that's a very important aspect. Absolutely, I, 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 I thought that that was uh, understood and I'm glad that you brought that into focus. I had some, uh, well, let me start again. The, when I first started doing the interproximal stripping myself, uh, was at a time when I don't think I had a high speed in the office. Hmm. And also, I was somewhat timid because I hadn't cut on teeth in 10 or 15 years. Hmm. And I referred the patients actually to one dentist who did a beautiful job. But then I became a little bit more comfortable with it and I started saying to the general dentist, no matter who it was, this is what I want to do. I need to get four millimeters or five millimeters of spacing. And I had, on a couple of cases, absolutely the wrong thing happen, where it looked as if the, the dentist took a high speed and s simply mm. just went back and forth through the contacts. Mm. And so I've become much more concerned myself with the quality of the stripping. And I think that, that uh, I'm sure you can do it as one time. If you knew that you needed five millimeters in a dental arch, you could get that at one time. Or you could do it incrementally. Which do you prefer, or is there a way of, of really telling on a given case? Well, I think what decides how much enamel you can remove is the morphology of the teeth. I don't trust the, the peck and peck ratio uh, or, or any other measurements because studies have shown that, that they are not clinically reliable anyhow. And I don't rely upon like taking half a millimeter in each contact. I have a differentiated approach where the shape of the teeth is deciding how much enamel can be removed. And this means that, for instance, take an example of a lower lateral incisor. Most of the time you can take away more on the distal surface of a tooth like that than on the mesial, so that um, the, the shape of the teeth decides how much you can take. O it's obvious you can take much more in triangular teeth than you can in a tooth with parallel uh, edges. And this then is the, if it is true, that the morphology decides how much you can remove, which I think it is. It doesn't make sense to do it incrementally, so we just do it in, in one sentence. But sometimes, in the course of treatment, we find that we need a little bit more room, and we can just do that. And, and most of the time, then, that's uh, uh, possible to do within uh, the morphology of the teeth. Are there any cases that you just flat out would not do interproximal stripping at all? That would be those cases where the interproximal edges are just parallel to start with because I need the contact points in the contact point area. I don't want it any other place. And if the teeth are completely parallel, there isn't any room. Well, you, well theoretically, you might go down in the root area, but that would be about the only instances. But it, it, it never happens. I mean, there's most teeth are triangular. Most teeth in adult patients are mal-worn or they, they, they are not in perfect shape. So there is, in my opinion, more often than not, if not always, a possibility to recontour teeth to a better shape than they are. Do you uh, see any other factors that we haven't considered yet about interproximal stripping? How much do you think, for example, again, not getting too carried away with it, how much space within an arch do you comfortably think you can attain given reasonable morphology of the teeth? Well, you, it, it's a variable because in some instances you can gain a lot and in others you can't gain, get, get very much. So I think then the morphology of the teeth, which is an individual thing, has to be judged individually. But there is one other area which we could discuss and that is how you leave the surface because there are studies that indicate that if you just take a diamond instrument and roughen the enamel, the enamel will be very rough with grooves and scratches. And these scratches will not uh, diminish or reduce, be reduced so that they completely go away with time. And there has been expressed concern that this may be an area where plaque can accumulate in these scratches and, 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 and grooves and cause caries. And that would be a problem, particularly if you just do slice cuts without any anatomical contouring of the teeth. So that, would, that would worry me. On the other hand, if you are broadening the contact points, if you are keeping anatomical contours, if you polish the surfaces, 
like after the diamond instrument you are using a garnet discs and maybe polishing strips or anything, I see no reasons for potential problems in cases like that. Have you ever seen really bad results from interproximal stripping, not necessarily your own cases, but uh, have you ever truthfully seen some place where you say, boy, this is really a bad yes, thing? Yes, yes, I have. And, and I think it's serious because it's like with most other techniques, uh, techniques by themselves are not very difficult, but they can be misused. If you take a thick diamond disc and you just flash it down between all the teeth doing slice cuts without any concern to the crowding you have or taking as about the same amount in each contact, you are not using the technique professionally. You are doing something that should not be done, and I have seen that. And I have seen that being made by colleagues who were not even aware of how bad it was. So I think that you have to have your eyes open to the possibilities of the technique, but then use it with care. So I guess to summarize, what, you're, what I'm getting out of this is that you think that it is a biologically compatible technique given common sense. Absolutely. That's a very good statement. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.